I'm going to talk about uh, a new alignment protocol, a new well, kind of proposal for a type of solution to alignment that I've called the precursor detection classification and assistance or in the short term protocol. So in this talk, there will be like three parts in the conclusion. I'm going to start about explaining building blocks that uh, we can get from information physicalism, which we are going to use to define this alignment protocol, and which you can actually combine in all sorts of ways that can be useful. Uh, the second part is going to be about the actual protocol. Like what do we do with this building blocks to make uh, aligned AI? Third part is going to be about some threats and responses to those threats, that you know, some things that can maybe go wrong. And we'll conclude it by giving a roadmap for you know, where do we go on from this and what are the key takeaways. So we'll start from the building blocks. So information physicalism, I'm not going to explain here uh, you know, in full what information physicalism is. Uh, I had like, uh, I think one hour talk about this and there's the article on the alignment forum. Uh, but just like to give kind of a very brief, you know, summary to what, what, what are we talking about here? That information physicalism is a framework for describing embedded agents. So agents that are, um, that kind of know that they're part of some universe and they have an unprivileged position in this universe. Um, and the way this framework works is by describing uh, things in terms of hypothesis, which are instead of, in some sense, have a bird's eye view rather than an agent centric view. So usually in like AI and reinforcement learning, we'll use to hypothesis the specified in terms of things that the agent can see or the agent can do. On the other hand, in information physicalism, hypotheses are specified from this kind of bird's eye view completely unrelated to the agent. So hypotheses are kind of beliefs about the state space phi times gamma, where phi is some space of physical states, which can change from hypothesis to hypothesis, and gamma is the space of like possible computational states, which where by computational states we mean assignments from programs to outputs, like something that tells us which program, which output each program would have. And you know, it might be the correct output or not the correct output, just like the space of all possibilities. Uh, and like hypothesis are beliefs about this thing, and then like, the, the whole juice is in some mathematical gadget called the bridge transform, which explains how do you transform such a bird's eye view hypothesis into something about uh, like the agent, how do you connect this to the agent centric view to uh, kind of prescribe what the agent should do in the universe. So, one thing this framework allows us to do is allows, it allows us to evaluate agents. Like given an agent, which I denote here by capital G, we can uh, give a quantitative measure of in like the loss function L, which is like, you know, what's the agent trying to, to optimize. We have like a quantitative measure of how smart is this agent and the way and it's defined by this equation. And okay, so the equation is like G small of G capital L equals to minus the logarithm of the probability where pi is taken inside. So pi is a policy for the agent, psi is some prior of the policies, which is supposed to be some kind of simplicity prior. And we're looking at the probability that the loss this agent gets with the policy pi smaller than equal than the loss it would get, it gets with its true policy. So G star is the policy that it actually implements. 
So in other words, what, what is this equation saying? It's saying that an agent is um, smart or, or like intelligent where the fraction of policies that do better than this agent is small, right? Like how optimized is this agent for, for, for this loss function? Like the less policies there are which do better than this agent, the more uh, intelligent this agent is. Yeah, I'm not sure we're drawing those red lines is a good idea. <laughs> so, yeah, by the way, if someone has a question, then feel free to uh, just, in, you can put it in the chat or just interrupt me, I guess there are not that many people. Yeah, so given that we know how to assign intelligence to agents according to loss functions, we can also try to invert this process to infer the loss function of the agent. So like now, suppose you're given an agent, and we're trying to find what loss function or utility function, which is like equivalent up to a sign, is the, the most reasonable to assign to such an agent. And this is kind of, you can think about it as, as formalizing Dennett's intentional step. We're, we're kind of looking at the system and we're trying to interpret the system as uh, optimizing for some goal. So for example, one mathematical prescription you could Follow in this case, uh, is, Vanessa. Yeah, is, is this? Am I right to think about this as some sort of inverse reinforcement le or learning? Like I, I see actions, and I sort of infer some sort of loss function. Or yeah. you're you're absolutely right. Is a certain uh -huh. inverse reinforcement learning. Um, there is a substantial novelty here in that where like in inverse reinforcement learning usually either assume that the, the agent is following the optimal policy or you're assuming that it's following the optimal policy plus noise whereas here uh, there is no such uh, assumption instead you're using a simplicity prior you're kind of trying to 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 use a simplicity prior to, to find out what agent is doing. Because like, you know, like what happens is the usual problem with this kind of thing is for any agent, you can say, okay, maybe your utility function is just do whatever you're doing, right? Like there's some agent following their po a certain policy and you can say, okay, maybe the utility function of this agent is, uh, this is an agent that really, really likes follows this specific policy. This is kind of dumb, it doesn't really add any information. But here, because we add this um, um, description complexity penalties, we don't uh, have this problem because in this equation, well, I haven't said what the equation is. But the equation is the probability of the utility function is proportional to two to minus the Kolmogorov complexity of the utility function or you know, some description complexity measure divided by the probability for a random policy that this random policy will achieve a loss smaller than what the agent achieves. So in other words, we're assigning more probabilities to loss functions such that, uh, uh, well, I use slightly confusing notation here because here I have L with loss function here, you the utility function, but you know, it's the same up to a sign. So we're assigning more probability to loss functions, such that on those loss functions, the agent is doing better than most other policies. And moreover, we're penalizing by complexity. So this, for example, means that if we build a contrived loss function that just, that just wants the agent to follow this exact policy, then all the bits will will kind of win in the denominator, will lose them in the numerator. So we haven't gained anything by this contrived construction. Uh, so like contrived loss functions do not get a lot of weight here. Whereas on the other hand, if my policy approaches the ideal policy for a particular loss function, then this probability of distributions become sharply concentrated on this particular loss function. 
because like for this loss function, the denominator is gonna be go to zero. So like it's, it's the ideal thing, then nothing computable. Well, like in the you know unbounded case, nothing computable can compete with it. So this probability goes to zero. Uh, so I'm, I'm not like super so, confident in this. Sorry. Yeah. Vanessa, um, can I yeah. summarize, I think what I understood? Um, okay. So we have a set of policies that are compatible what, with what with what we see, maybe, or what we. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how the the set of policies are constrained. The set of policies is like you you have a specific agent G, and this specific agent G follows a very specific policy G star. So there's just one policy, and here we have just the prior over policies, which are just like all computable policies, or in the bounded context, it could be all policies computable with some particular computation uh, constraint, but okay. there's just like a prior, there's just like an uninformed so, prior over everything. So, so th this is an enormous uh, set. Mm -hmm. This is like absolutely okay. Um, right. And then, you take some as a measure on all policy, some sort of Kolmogorov complexity measure. Is, is that right? So, so there is like here some kind of a simplicity prior, some kind of a Solomonov measure over policy. Yeah. And here there is also a, a complexity penalty on the complexity of the utility function. So there are like two places where this uh, kind of complexity weighting appears here. Uh, okay, so so it's on pairs of the policy and and the and the um, loss function. Uh, yes. There's some no. some Solomonov or Kolmogorov measure, and then you take the one you you guess that the the right loss function is the one that uh, on average uh, this. Uh, this policy does be beats all other policies. Is, is that right? So, so that's about right. So the, the right loss function is the loss function such that my policy looks rarely successful in it compared to a random policy uh, where you kind of correct for the complexity of, the, of this loss function, right? Because like you don't want very contrived loss functions that were just designed to to fit this particular policy. So if compared to the you know, compared to the number of bits that you need to describe the loss function, the, you, you need like even more bits, even way more bits to, to describe a policy which does as well as your policy, then it means that this is a really good loss function for this. This is a very fitting loss function for this agent. Um, so like, yeah, so like the number of bits of optimizations you need to use to get something which does on this loss function as well as the ancient is much more than the number of bits you need to describe the loss function itself. That's kind of the criterion here. Um, yeah, so I'm not like super confident that this exact equation is right. I haven't really studied this in depth, but I feel like something along those lines uh, has to be like the right thing. But we need to like prove theorems about this. That, that this kind of thing should be actually sure what, what's the uh, exact right formula. Vanessa, yeah. Um, have you heard about the max causal entropy principle? Um, it's it's very similar. Um, it, it's something like the right loss function in inverse reinforcement learning uh, under a set of features or constraints is the one that maximizes the causal entropy. Um, and so it's 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 very similar in in that it's uh, sort of it 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 doesn't um, yeah it, yeah, it doesn't. It, it sort of is, is like a simplicity prior as well. And it has this, yeah. 
I don't think that the max entropy actually introduces a simplicity prior, unless it's the entropy with respect to simplicity prior or something. But okay, I, I, I don't know. I think mean, that's maybe something discussed later, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's doing the same thing. Um, so it's important to understand that uh, uh, inference from policy is not enough. So the, just think that we have some principle how to infer loss functions from policies, it still leaves a whole bunch of core difficulties in the alignment problem. And in particular, we have the difficulty of how do we even know, know the policy in the first place? Um, like, you know, if, like for example, you can make some observations of maybe what the user is doing, but that doesn't give you the entire policy, right? It just gives you like some observations, which might or might not be enough information. The second problem is what to do if, like, how do you do this exactly? Like you can imagine some setup which where, which is kind of what people usually imagine in inverse reinforcement learning, where the user, for example, inputs, inputs actions somehow, and you know, the AI gets those actions and tries to infer something based on that. But the problem is that, that here we're kind of pointing at the user using this particular input channel. But what if the AI uh, hacks this channel? You know, maybe the AI cuts the cord here and inserts another cord. And now the AI can kind of insert anything it wants and create its own fake user with a much more easy to optimize utility function, for example. Or, what if the AI modifies the user itself? What if you know the AI brainwashes the user, makes it drink some weird drugs that cause it to behave in other ways such that its utility function becomes more convenient for the AI? And uh, besides all of these problems, we also have the problem of mass optimizers more generally or a causal attacks more specifically. So I want to zoom in on this last point for a moment. So what are a causal attacks? A causal attacks are some scenario that was described by Paul Cristiano in his article about why the Solomon prior is maligned. And it talks about uh, agents that come to believe in malign simulation hypothesis. So Imagine your AI like having some hypothesis about how the universe works, which is a relatively like normal hypothesis, like the sort of thing that we would kind of agree with. On the other hand, it might also entertain a different hypothesis in which everything that the AI sees is actually part of some simulation by some powerful agent in some universe with other laws. And, but this simulation kind of deviates from our universe at some strategically chosen point. And the reason why, you know, why this simulation might be a, a probable hypothesis, why would like this alien agents create the simulation in the first place is that precisely because they want to influence the AI's decision-making in order for it to have confidence consequences in our universe that are profitable to those agents, to those attackers. So there's a kind of loop here where the AI reasons about those agents reasoning about the AI, and it kind of, there is a sort of a causal handshake that might cause the AI to do something weird. Like, you know, for example, those attackers can say, well, in our simulation, the, this our AI needs to run a different AI programmed with their utility function. And if it doesn't do that, then something really bad happens. And if it does do that, something really good happens. And that's like the rules of the simulation, whereas in the real universe, of course, it will cause the AI to run, to, to run some online AI, which would be really bad for us and good for the attackers. So this is kind of a type of... Uh, yeah, so, sorry, Vanessa. Uh, th this interesting question, this sounds a lot like 
sort of Rocco's Basilisk. Um, are we like, <laughs> I don't know, how serious should we? It seems kind of a weird thing, right? How serious should we take this? Um, how realistic is this in your opinion? And why, yeah, why should I, like, I think if, if you believe this, why don't I, uh, why don't we have people sort of succumbing to Roku's Basilisk? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, certainly structurally similar to, to Roku's Basilisk. It's another type of a causal trait. Uh, it's certainly very, very weird. So it, it triggers the heuristic, but, I would think that it's very hard to, to, as far as I can tell, to translate this weirdness into an actual argument why it's wrong. <laughs> uh, it's actually, th this effect is actually expected to be especially overwhelming for agents which are not information physical. But for information physical, it's not quite as bad. For agents which are not physical, there's like the comp description complexity of hypothesis is such and the simulation hypothesis has an enormous advantage, but for physicalists, it doesn't have an enormous advantage. Um, but it, it still might be uh, like a valid hypothesis from the eye's perspective. As to why people do not succumb, well, for one thing, people do not have what I call a what, theory. Why am I, am I, can, why am I not succumbing to Roku's Basilisk, right? right. Uh, I, Like the problem with people that people are not capable of doing this uh, causal handshakes. I, I don't know any or answer something. I mean, possible, but uh, what it, what makes a future AI different from us? Our reasoning that it is suspectable to these a causal attacks. One major difference is that. Um, one major difference is that the AI might actually be smart enough to create a theory of what I call a medical cosmology. So the AI might be actually smart enough to figure out what kind of universes with simple laws of physics have intelligent agents in them, what kind of things statistically right. on average those intelligent agents might want, and you know which of them would was launch right. such a causal attacks and so forth. Whereas we at our current we, in, in our current state, present like state of knowledge, we're not yet sufficiently advanced to, to be able to tackle those questions. Uh, so like even if I consider a simulation right. hypothesis, it would be it wouldn't move me to do anything because I have no idea what the simulators want. Like I cannot guess it without having an actual science of like how the multiverse looks like, which is not something we developed. Uh, and then that's one point, that's one important point of difference between us and the AI. Another point of difference is that we kind of already know what our utility function is. We don't need to figure it out. So even if I know what, uh, even if I, you know, entertain this, uh, uh, Simulation hypothesis, I can still end up behaving reasonably. For example, you mentioned Rocco's Basilisk. So Rocco's Basilisk is, I want to explain what it is here, but it's actually a blackmail scenario. It's in a causal blackmail with someone threatens you with bad things. But rational agents that follow kind of, that follow, you know, update as decision theory do not succumb to blackmail. And this is actually a theory. So information agents provably do not succumb to, to blackmail. So this is actually not a problem that this AI would have. And this is also not a problem we, well, hopefully it's not a problem we would have because we also have at least some intuitions against succumbing to blackmail. So, you know, even if I had a theory of medical cosmology, I might, it's, it's probable that I could still define by, by still like being sufficiently resolute to, to reject blackmails and everything would be okay. But the AI is in a more difficult position because the AI doesn't even know what its utility function is. It's trying to infer the utility function from the user, but if it's now in the simulation, then the user is 
can be something entirely different, can be some entity inside a simulation. And that introduced another uh, layer of problems that just do not ex happen for, for people, even if people were as smart as AI and so forth. So, so, so Vanessa, suppose like uh, we made some great breakthrough in string theory or something, and they're able to, you know, whatever, compute all the whole landscape, 10 to the 500 worlds or whatever. Um, would, would that be come to like extreme precision? I, I don't know. I, I guess I, I can imagine some, some actual breakthroughs in these uh, mathematical cosmology. Um, sh would you expect then that people would sit, seriously entertain, could, could seriously entertain simulation uh, hypotheses uh, and be like suspectable to blackmail in that way? I mean, string theory would not be necessarily enough because string theory is not the entire multiverse. Like the multiverse is more like Tagmark 4, right? It's like all possible. Like we, we like concentrating to string theory is like assuming that the baseline reality runs in string theory, but string theory might be only a property of the simulation. The baseline mm -hmm. reality might run in some completely different uh -huh. physics. And moreover, even if we knew that the baseline reality runs in string theory, and even if we figured out all the landscape of string theory, we would still have a lot of work in front of us figuring out what kind of agents live in those universes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so let's see. So, um, yeah, so information physicalism allows us to define a notion of what programs are running in, in, in the universe. And that's like important building block we we're gonna use. And that's something which is precisely mathematically defined, but just to give kind of a notion of, of like a kind of reminder slash intuitive notion of how it works. Uh, so given a program whose output is a bit zero or one, we consider two counterfactual. One counterfactual with this program output zero, so there's a kind of logical counterfactuals. And the other is the counterfactual which the program outputs one. And we look at what's the physical state of the universe is like in those two counterfactuals. And if it's different, if it's definitely distinct when the program runs, if it's not distinct, then it doesn't run, or more precisely, we have no idea uncertainty. There's also something in between, like overlapping probability distributions where the program runs with some probability. And here there's like an example where an AI is controlling a robotic arm. So the AI is computing some program and according to the output of the program, deciding whether to move the robotic arm up or down. So in the counterfactual, which this program up at zero, the robotic arms move up. Counterfactual where it's equal to one, the robotic arms move down. So the physical state of the universe is distinct in those two logical counterfactuals. And this is how we know, or kind of this is the idea behind the definition, which says that in such a universe, this program is actually mine. But this is just intuition. There is an actual definition of what it means. Um, yeah. Yeah, religion is kind of an example of a causal text in here. So, um, so counterfactual. So I mentioned counterfactuals. How do counterfactuals actually work? So information is counterfactuals usually work by just intersecting creedal sets. It's, it's kind of very simple. And that's what I call here. So, and that's what I call on the slide hard counterfactuals. But the thing with those counterfactuals is that they might get kind of tricky when you're trying to apply them to computations that are simpler than the agent itself. So if we think about different kinds of computations, we can put them on a kind of a spectrum of computational complexity from easy to hard. So here, for example, two plus two equal five, that's a very easy computation. So those are examples of counterfactuals, you know, things that are not necessarily true, but like we could kind of consider as a, as a logical counterfactual. So two plus two equals five is a kind of counterfactual for a very simple computation the AKS prime number detection algorithm running on this number equals false. This is also counterfactual, but 
much more uh, complex one. Uh, this is actually not true because this number is actually prime. Uh, so a human brain outputting an output, which is like saying the words, I'm a tree, is another logical counterfactual if you regard the algorithm running as a brain, if it's an abstract algorithm. And then like in the AI, which might be more powerful than the user outputting something is another logical counterfactual. And maybe we can also consider agents even more uh, complex than their own AI. So for the agent itself, hard counterfactuals work really well. Like for the considering counterfactuals specifically on the policy, what the agent will do, hard counterfactuals work very well because essential information is behaves like kind of um, like kind of playing chicken against the universe in, in the logical harsh and security where like uh, information agents, uh, they kind of have this property of always having 19 uncertainty about what I'm going to do. Because if you would know, if I would know what I'm going to do, then I would do the opposite. <laughs> and this kind of diagonalization creates uh, this property that there's always 19 uncertainty over my own policy. Therefore, it's always they're always well-defined counterfactuals. Whereas for a human, for example, if the AI wants to consider counterfactual what a human might do, then this counterfactual might come out contradictory. If maybe the AI can predict that the human will not say the phrase, I'm a tree. And then like counterfactualing on the AI saying I'm a tree will produce contradictions in like an empty set or something. Yeah, like the zero set more than that. So for this, there might be it, might, it can be interesting to think about ways to generalize it. And that's what I'm calling here soft counterfactuals. So for example, one proposal I have for how to build soft counterfactuals are to, to look at our prior, look at only hypotheses which are coarser than the current hypothesis. So Gretel sets which contain our sets, like have more 19 uncertainty. And look on this portion of the prior, so the prior conditional on being coarser, and apply the hard counterfactual to it and normalize. So basically what, what this procedure is doing is saying, okay, if according to the current hypothesis, I can predict that the human is not gonna say my tree. Let's see what the minimal kind of, you know, what's the minimal way to throw away information to make my hypothesis slightly weaker, such that we don't no longer know for sure what the human is gonna say. And in that kind of weaker hypothesis, we can, we can consider a well-defined counterfactual of what happens if the human says I'm a tree. A different approach could be changing viewpoints and changing to the viewpoint of the human where the human can form counterfactuals on, uh, about themselves. But then you need to do some kind of translation between those two viewpoints. And I haven't really defined how to do it, but this is another idea that may be worth exploring. So those Different kinds of logical counterfactuals are not a building block. We're going to, the information is gives us and that we're going to use. Another building block we can make from this previous building blocks is what I call agentic causality. So, um, so agentic causality is like, imagine we have two agents, Alice and Bobcat. And we want to know however, and they have timelines. You know, this is like the subjective timeline of each of those agents. And we want to know where actions that Alice takes at this point are gonna be visible to Bobcat on this point on, on their timeline. Or yeah, on his time. So the way we can formalize this is by saying, okay, let's consider counterfactuals in which Alice is doing different things at this point of time. And in each of those counterfactuals, let's see what are the observations that Bob can see. So observations are actually defined through which programs are running the information physicalist. It's like consider the program, which is this agent and with what inputs the universe is running it. And this is like the observations. And we can even quantify the strength of this causal relationship. So we can imagine that Alice is doing random actions here. So she's saying penguin monkey taco because this randomly came out, the thing that she's supposed to say. And we can look at, measure the mutual information between her actions and Bobcat's observations. And this gives us kind of quantitative information, theoretic measure of how strong the causal 
link between this point on Ellie's subjective timeline and this point on Balkis' subjective timeline. That's another nice building block that information physical gives us. Okay, and now with all these building blocks, we can define what the actual protocol is going to be. So the protocol is going to rely on some notion of precursor. So if G is an agent, then H, which is another agent, also can be a coalition of other agents, is called a precursor of G when H can prevent G from existing. So H has some policy, such as if H follows this policy, then G will not run out. Vanessa, yeah. uh, what is, I mean, I'm sure you've said this before, but what is the exact definition? What, what do you have like an exact definition of an agent? What is, what is a definition of an agent for you? Yeah, but by agent, I mean, by agent, I mean a program which gets a high score on this metric. So it's not the hard definition, it's a soft definition. Like any program we could, like consider as an agent, where some programs are more agenty and some programs are less agenty, and we're going to to use this fact also. And and like, what is a more is, agenty program? What does that mean? So more agenty means it has a higher G number. It scores better. More, more precisely, we need to consider the G number for all possible loss functions. Take. I'm going to say this in, 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 in a couple more slides, but it's like take the G minus the Kolmogorov complexity of, of L and maximize it. And that's like the kind of L independent G and the absolute G of the agent. So that's like how agent it is. So there's a number so between it's like zero how, to how well it does over different loss functions or? No, it's how well it does over some loss function. It's like, is there some loss function which is done surprisingly where, well com compared to the complexity of this loss function? You know, like if the complexity of loss function is just equal to the complexity of the policy, then it's not surprising because we can just hard code the loss function to, to promote this policy. But if the agent does much better on some loss function than the complexity of the loss function, then it's kind of doing surprisingly well. So it's like an agenty problem. So it's, it's, it's a sort of compression statement, if you will. Yeah, it's a sort of compression statement. So you can think of like A psi is gonna have like G equals to infinity and so well, here it's physical, so it's not A psi, but if you were and, doing and, this in the Cartesian version, then A psi would have G infinity, well, assuming and, that it's prior. How does it act? How does what act? How does the agent act? So the agent is just like the, we just regard an agent as a program whose input is like a history, a, the past history, and whose output is an action. So so the agent is just a policy. Okay. But it, it's going to be also important that there is a particular program representing this policy. Uh, and then we can use our definition of our computationalism and physicalism to say which programs are running. So physicalism is telling us which programs are running according to this hypothesis. And then for each of the programs are running, we can ask how agent is this program according to this number. So, so combining those things tells you uh, like which agents are run or exist in the universe under any particular hypothesis. So an agent is called, one agent is a precursor, another one if you prevent it from existing. And Sorry, Vanessa, have you now already explained this physicalism, like how we how we are able to tell when an agent is running or are you gonna do that now? So information physicalism has a definition of how do we define when a program is run? I'm not explaining this in this presentation because that's ah, like okay. a whole separate talk. Um, but but like once we have a definition of which programs are running, and we also have a definition of how agent a given program is, which we also have in probation physically, 
then the composition of those two tells us like which agent exists in the universe. So I'm not explaining those things in detail because that's just like the information physicalism here. Yeah, and that's its own article and yeah, that would be like its own talk, which I also gave before. But... <laughs> Um, so here we just accept that those definitions exist. Um, right, so given such a precursor, okay, so, so yeah, and, and here, yeah, given such a precursor, we can kind of extrapolate it to, to make a, a full agent from it. So what, what do I mean by that? Um, so, here, when I say that an agent is running, these are some particular instances of the agent. So there is some program such that it is this program with some particular inputs is running. But this leaves some degrees of ambiguity because maybe there are several equivalent programs, which are maybe there are several programs which are equivalent on those particular inputs but not equivalent to other inputs. And then all of them are running. Uh, so, but like which of them is the real quote unquote agent? Like how do we, like th there's like a whole family of agents here and we want to just take one out of them. So the way we do it is we extrapolate it while maximizing the agenticness. So we consider which ways to continue, which of those Program, which of this family of programs that are equivalent to those inputs has the maximal agentics in a score. Well, the agentic score is, like I said before, the maximum of G minus the common growth complexity of L over a different L. So we're kind of looking for the most agentic interpretation of this particular instance of, of, of like particular set of instances of the program. Um, okay, and okay, so there's a bunch of agents. Some of them are precursors of the AI. And now we want to decide which of those precursors is the actual user of the AI. And so this is like, so previously that was like the detection part and now it's the classification part. So how do we decide which agent is the user? And for this, we use the agentic causality thing. So the user has this property that, you know, I can look at when the AI wakes up, I can look at what other agents is it causally, is this waking up point causally linked to? So it's kind of like looking at the future light cone of the, of the AI's origin point and seeing like which other agents it intersects. And then at the point where another agent it intersects another agent. So intersects means that this point is not like in causal, it's not causally linked to here, but this point is causally linked to here. I can look at now the future light cone starting from here. So where, where on which points in the AI's timeline do I have a causal link here? And if I have a strong link here with a short duration, then I define this as the user. So what's happening here, imagine that the AI wakes up with the user sitting in the same room and there's nobody else in the room and hopefully there are no other animals in the room or you know, it could kind of go badly like in, there's the horror film, The Fly, where the fly enters the teleporter. So here it can be something like this, just with AI starting to maximize the fly's preferences. So yeah, but let's suppose that there's nothing so in the room except the AI. And the so, so the, the user is us, right? It's humans. The user is a human in this particular example. Or yeah, in yeah. this particular way to, to, to configure. Yeah, yeah, but but it's if 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 this would work, it would be us. If this would work, it would be so the user is a human. Yeah. We want there is a certain human who we call the user, and we're trying to get the eye to do what the user wants to want. We can also generalize it to like having multiple users, but that's that's not really the, the part where the core difficulty is. So currently let's just simplify it and imagine that there's a single user and we want to just make our AI follow the preferences of the single user. 
so so it's 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 really recognizing its parent so precursor in this sense would be like a parent it's is, is that right or yeah but but it can have a lot of parents like anyone who could prevent the ai's existence at any point of history is a precursor uh, right you know maybe my right. cat is a precursor because she could have jumped on the keyboard and, and messed things up so uh so are these ways and uh, do you want them to be weighted like everybody like the 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 Shapley value of everybody contributing to creating the AI will decide it will no, this is on. not what I'm trying to do here like we could try to do something like here but here I'm explaining something simpler here I'm explaining something which just selects one particular human out of the all the agents that you know not doing any shapely values of integers. There's one particular user, her name is Alice, okay? There is uh, Alice, we want the AI followed Alice preferences. How do we do this, okay? So, so maybe in reality, we don't want the AI to just follow Alice preferences. We want to aggregate the preferences of many people or something like that, but that's, let's just kind of ignore this for now. And just for to simplify the problem, Assume that we just want the AI to follow Alice, what Alice wants to happen, okay? So, so how could we arrange this? So we, we're, the way we arrange this is we put Alice in the room with the AI and we do this kind of handshake thing. Well, maybe I should start going a little faster because it's... Uh, okay. The other part is how to defend from this a causal attack. And uh, okay, and the thing I'm going to use here is that a causal attacker is also going to show up as a precursor, right? If you're if the eye is entertaining a malign hypothesis, a malign simulation hypothesis, and in the malign simulation hypothesis, the causal attacker is a precursor of the AI. But in, whereas in the real hypothesis, so in the real world, which precursors can the AI possibly have, right? You can have like humans, you can have animals, anything that registers as an agent and could maybe other AIs, and that's it. So the idea here is, and this is not a trivial task by any margin, but, but it is a potentially maybe tractable one, to try to kind of classify all the safe agents, all the agents we kind of expect in a normal hypothesis to show up as precursors. And this way by elimination, any agent which is outside of, the, of this area is gonna be a potential attacker. So let's suppose, for example, there, for example, malign attackers are likely to be very, very intelligent. Like if someone is doing a causal attack, they probably constructed some crazy super AI to do this, right? So, so if we just look at the G parameter as a measure of intelligence, then we're talking about agents with very high G. The actual metric there can be also multi-dimensional because we can take G, computational resource constraints. And, but so we have some multi-dimensional thing that can measure how intelligent agents are and attackers are gonna be pretty intelligent. So we can just make a cut. Of In addition to that, AIs that we know to exist, well, we probably know a lot about how their source code looks like, so we can just make a formal specification that will cover all the AIs that we know, you know to exist or in our projects or other projects. And the third thing, which is the most tricky one to actually pull off, if, if, if we need it, and maybe we do, is to have some kind of, uh, maybe we can use knowledge that we have from cognitive science, to build some super, super rough model of what human is. So build some very large ball in the space of all possible agents that knows it contains humans. So it's like, you know, nowhere near a perfect or even anywhere close to perfect model of the human brain, but it's something, it's like some set of properties that we do know human brains to have and which are kind of pretty relatively human brain specific and not just any agent gonna have. And this is another search. And then we can say that, okay, anything that either falls under this threshold or in this box or in this circle, we consider safe. If there is any agent, any precursor, 
outside of this thing, then this thing is not a normal world. This thing hypothesis is just not a correct hypothesis, particularly it might be a more insinuation hypothesis, and we're just gonna discard it. And this brings us to what the protocol is. So the protocol is we have a set of hypotheses, like usual information physics model. For each hypothesis, we run precursor detection, then we run classification, which means understanding who the user is and who possible attackers are. So for example, in this hypothesis, Alice was detected as a user. Here, Bobcat was detected as a user. Here, some weird creature was detected as a user. And also, some other weird thingy, some alien AI thing, was detected as a potential attacker. So this hypothesis was discarded. And the remaining hypothesis, we kind of compose this utility function that we extract from them using value inference to build like the overall utility function of our agent, for example, using maximum lottery. And then the assist part is just, you know, follow policy to maximize this case according to, to information physically. So this is like the entire system in a nutshell. Okay, so I don't have tons of time remaining here. So I guess let's try to do this quickly. So let's try to analyze what can or cannot go wrong here. So let's return to the slide with the problems that we had. The slide where we said just inferring values from policy is not enough. So what happens to those problems? So what if the I hacks the channel? That's like one class could probably have an inverse reinforcement learning. This problem is completely irrelevant here because there is no channel to have. Like the, the way AI is detecting the user is just by kind of understanding what the universe looks like and which agents are running in the universe. It's not pointing at a user using some specific channel. How do we learn the user's policy? So now information physicalism helps us in the sense that we're not just looking at some particular observate actions of the user, we're actually looking at which programs are running. So we have some more information. We have actually noticing which computation is producing those outputs and not just where the outputs are. And then we're doing this maximal agency extrapolation to uh, complete the things that we kind of don't observe, which I claim is actually a pretty good idea because for example, it means that various weird states in which the brain could end up with, like taking some weird drugs, will not show up in this analysis. So if those weird states are unnatural, kind of not coherent with the, with the actual behavior of the user in the actual real world, like, you know, the user did not actually take any weird drugs, then those states will not contribute to the utility function that's going to be inferred. And what if the AI modifies the user? So here we kind of avoid this problem entirely because the AI can only modify things in its causal future, but we're only, we're like, to, we're defining the user as only the instances of the program that are running outside of the AI causal future. So when we reach the AI causal future, we just cut off and don't look anymore and we extrapolate from there. So anything the AI does to modify the user or, or, or like to hack the user's brain or whatever, it's just not gonna do, make any difference on the utility function. And the AI is not incentivized to do it. And incentivized, of course, not to do it if the user doesn't actually want this thing to be done to them. And then the inner alignment thing, where here there's my big hypothesis, which I haven't by any means proved, but have some intuitive arguments, which is that specifically for information physicalism, the only type of mass optimizer that can really arise is the causal attack. And we're hopefully having the causal attack using this filtration mechanism. And notably, this defends both against Cartesian attack and non Cartesian attacks, or by non Cartesian, I mean attacks that use some hardware exploits and don't even show up on the actions that the AI is, is trying to take. And there's some model of this that you can using tuning and reinforcement learning. I don't think I really have time to go into this. Uh, so one problem that does come up here is what if aliens show up as a false positive in the causal attack detector? Like aliens are trying to build maybe 
thinking in order to build their own AI, and that's logically correlated with humans thinking in order to build their AI. And so aliens deciding not to build their AI would cause our AI not to get built. So in the logical causation sense, maybe the aliens become precursors, and then the whole hypothesis gets filtered out because the aliens are detected as a causal attackers. And that's bad because it's actually a true hypothesis. And here I have some solutions, which there's one thing you, which I call like detect human like a position, which I don't think I have time to really explain. And another thing is maybe try to using physical causality instead of logical causality, or we could just hope that this logical correlation is not actually sufficiently strong in practice. And maybe we don't really need to worry about this. I don't have a sufficiently good intuition about which logical correlations are actually gonna end up being strong in the formalism. So I can really be sure one way or the other. Uh, another thing that could happen is that if our AI coexists with other AIs which are bad, then uh, one of the bad AIs can try to copy our AI source code and use that to create another fake user to compete with our real users. And we can try to solve this by introducing some secret perturbations into the source code that hopefully the AI will not know about, or by having some scheme where the user depends on the actual history observed, and then the original, you know, our AI will follow what the real user does, and the, the other AI will follow what the bad thing does, but we still have our good AI, so we're still as good as we could be in, in, you know, in this scenario where we need to compete with other malign AIs happening at the same time. Um, okay. And there is a roadmap of all sorts of things that, you know, where we are now versus where we need to be in order for this to actually be a solution that we can implement. And above the dash lines are various topics, which we can research right now to make progress in this. Below the dash line, various topics that when we make enough progress in those boxes, we could start researching those boxes. Um, so I guess I won't go into this because we're kind of low on time, but but just to give you some idea that there's definitely lots and lots of work we need to do <laughs> to, to actually get to something uh, you know, mostly practical. But there is also, all of those boxes actually contained kind of shall we ready problems that we can work on in order to make progress towards this goal. Um, Okay, and I'm gonna finish with three main takeaways that I hope you will take from this talk, and then we'll go to questions. So the first takeaway is that information physicalism points to a powerful toolbox for formalizing agent relationships. So maybe the specific way in which I specified like how to select the user, how to filter malign attackers, maybe this specific way is not the best way, or maybe it's even completely has some fatal flaws, but it seems still seems that the tools of like and the fact that we can define counterfactuals, we can define which programs are running, which agents are running, what the agents want, what their causal relationship between them are. These seem like really powerful tools that give us a lot of degrees of freedom for building various specifications that hopefully can uh, make our AI be aligned. The second takeaway is that this whole scheme might enable what I call ambitious alignment. So we're talking here about actually learning the values of the user, like and actually you know, optimizing the full values of the user rather than just strawberries. Like you know, Miri has this plan that you know, saying that CV is too hard, we're just gonna do an AI which puts a strawberry on the plate, but that it's also hard. So I don't want to put a strawberry on the plane here. I want to do the full thing. And that's because I think that the full thing is actually easier because here I don't need to kind of deal with this corrigibility problem, which is possibly completely intractable, but I need to deal with other problems, which I claim look more tractable at this stage. And finally, this approach is as far as I can tell, the only known approach to defense from a causal attack well, yeah, I think that nothing else which was proposed was especially convincing. Was, I think everything else that was proposed in this front was much less convincing. And by extension, the only, 
hopefully a, a robust approach to protect against meso optimizers and in particular against non Cartesian meso optimizers, which are especially insidious and really hard to do anything about by any other way. And I think I'll stop here and we'll go to questions. <laughs>